Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt and we thank you for joining us. This week we are joined by theoretical physicist and host of the Mindscape podcast, Sean Carroll. And remember, we take your questions each episode, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, and don't forget to tell us where you're from. Please check out the links to our recent sponsors in the show notes, and we thank them you for supporting our sponsors. It really helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Okay, James, first of all, happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, but let's talk about Joe Biden, who is off, I think you agree, with a, to a very auspicious start. Uh, first eight weeks, uh, entire cabinet has been confirmed. The critical COVID stimulus legislation approved, and he's out there selling it. It's really a ter- terrific bill. It's going to help Biden and Democrats, I think. But there's a big danger that looms. It's, it's the border. Uh, As we come out of the pandemic, the economy starts to take off. More migrants are seeking refuge here from the dangers and deprivations at home. Uh, And if Arizona and Texas Democrats say that this border is a crisis, then the Biden administration better say it's a crisis. And Republicans like Kevin McCarthy and Ted Cruz, I guess on his way to Cancun, are dashing to the border in order to try to make political hay. And you have people like the National Review's Rich Lowry writing, boy, the Trump policy really worked and now Biden's screwing it all up. Now, that's utter nonsense, but politically it's dangerous. And I think they have to do more, they being the Biden administration, than just say, be patient. It's a tough problem. Yeah, it is a tough problem. Yeah, you do have to be patient. But I think as you and I discussed, they got to find someone to take charge of this down there, help the Homeland Security Secretary. I don't know whether it's a General Stanley McChrystal or something, because it really is a worrisome problem. I'm going to go on a rant here, all right? Because I I, I, I literally, when you think about this, it infuriates me to no end. So we have the campaign. Biden is running, and they say, we're for open borders. He says, I am for no such thing, And, and got a lot of criticism for it. So then... The right wing goes and says, if Biden is winning, they're going to be open borders. They're going to be open borders. They're open borders. He was decidedly not for that. And then after he wins, they start broadcasting that all coming to the United States, that they'll flood the borders. They're going to let everybody in. Of course, as opposed to 40 percent of the people in America who demand to be lied to, these poor people in Guatemala, Honduras, you know, don't understand what mega fucking liars that Fox News is. So they say, well, Biden's going to let us in. And they show up at the borders. And then we say, it's Joe Biden's fault. Well, it's no such thing. It's Fox News's fault that we have this crisis in the border. And we cannot fall into that. And Biden is doing just what he needs to do. He just said, well, I don't have open borders. Go back to your homes. Go back. You know, we have a, we have a, asylum rules. We can tweak those. We, we, we have refugee rules. But we are a nation of rules. But they are the ones. It was Fox News and, and, and oh, oh, One America, whatever the hell they are, Newsmax. They created this crisis. And then when they create the crisis, they get their sorry asses on the border to try to blame Biden for it. And the Democratic response is frankly wimpy. You own that border, sir. That is your border. You told these poor people, these struggling people, to come here on the pretense of a lie. And that's what happened in this. And when people fucking realize that, if they're smart enough to do it, they ought to turn this back and jam it right up their right-wing asses. I've had my piece. Well, you've had your piece. Uh, I think you're substantively right, but I still worry about it politically. I think that it's something that uh, every cable news network will lead with it at night, whether they're Fox or whether they're MSNBC. They'll have a different spin. You, you know, but, if he shows up and, on that board, yeah, that's sound well, let me finish. There's something else, too, that there there is, you know, you want to have a humane policy. They're children. They're little kids coming across this border. And you've got to be humane at the same time you also have to enforce rules. There is a there is a dilemma there. I think the Times... I had their lead story the other day that said there is no easy answer. I think they're right. Look, I 
again, I just know he's answered. They were lied to, but not by Joe Biden, mm-hmm. not by the New York Times. All right. They're there because of Fox News. And, and oh, it's, of course, it's complicated. And of course, what we're going to do is give a win. Well, it's kind of complicated. And you got this and that. If he goes to the border and gives a sanitized, you know, non vulgar speech that I give, they got to cover that. They got to cover that. That's why you hear, you hear because you lied to. We're going to take care, we're going to feed you and do everything we can to help you, but you're not going to be able to come in the country until we meet certain, certain metrics here. Hey, James, another topic. Uh, the Intelligence Committee this week told us that guess what? Russia did try to interfere in the 2020 election. That's after they interfered in the 2016 election. So one thing we know for sure, the Russian hoax was not a hoax. I don't think they'd succeeded much this year, but they did it. And uh, I don't expect Fox News to be caring a lot about that. Don't worry about it. John, Ron Johnson's on the case. We got to, you know, that, that's one thing you got to say about that man. He might be more conservative than we are. It might be a little bit, but when it comes to the interests of the United States, you can really count on Senator Ron Johnson or Wisconsin. They don't, none of them, none of them, they're all for it. They put their political interests ahead of the interests of the United States. It's that simple, and somebody just has to say it. Now, I'll tell you not all. I've got to be careful to be. So there's some people that put the interests of the United States higher than the political interests that claim to be in the Republican Party. But let me tell you something. It's not very many. It's not very many at all. Well, you know, when, uh, I don't know, Rudy Giuliani is probably Ron Johnson's counsel these days. Um, he may be in real legal trouble in this, by the way. But uh, of it's, he uh, it, is, it is the constant refrain. They won't stop. They lie. The Russian hoax, the Russian hoax. Wasn't the hoax, guys. It happened. But part of part of the problem, a little bit, is Democrats are not aggressive enough and do not correctly frame issues. And uh, uh, look, whatever happened to Andrew, they, they're going to investigate it. But the, the lead, four lead stories that you see are all about Andrew Cuomo. If Andrew Cuomo was a Republican, you wouldn't see shit about it. I'm not saying it shouldn't be investigated. I'm not saying it's a serious charge. And, but the democratic position, the democratic culture, right, is to be collaborative, to 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 say, look, there's a way we can sort of do this. And their, their, their and I'm not saying we should have that culture where we just lie about everything, but there has to be a general toughening up here, and more than just a little bit. You know, and I, I go back to my thing on the border. Our first reaction is five different oh shit. Is opposed to come out of come out of with both barrels blazing, and I think that's the way you win political arguments. Okay, and, and it's a it's, it's, it is a cultural thing in the Democratic Party. It it really is. Democrats are like believe in in complication and not being non judgmental and and that kind of stuff. And I mean that's all fine. But that, that that you're not you're not gonna you you you're bringing a toothpick to a, you know fifty caliber machine gun fight and you keep wondering why you don't prevail. Yes. Sean Carroll is a distinguished physicist at the California Institute of Technology, uh, a resident expert on quantum physics. He's authored four books, many articles, wrote a blog, and hosts wide-ranging podcast. He's noted for making very complicated subjects understandable. Dr. Carroll, that'll be a test for you today with James and me, but we thank you so much for being with us. Tell us why quantum physics is important to us understanding our existence. Well, I think that's a very good way of putting it because, you know, quantum physics is important to technology, to how lasers work and transistors work, et cetera. But I think the main attraction of trying to think about it is that we are just human beings and we want to understand the world in which we live. And quantum mechanics, which came along in the early 20th century, is the way the world is, as far as we know. It's behind all of our understanding of the laws of physics at the deepest level. That's I think it was your predecessor, I read, uh, Richard Feynman, I hope I pronounced that correctly, who said that quantum mechanics, quantum uh, physics will never be fully understood. You know, explain what that means, and do you agree? 
yeah, it's Feynman, how he pronounced it. And what he actually said is that nobody understands quantum mechanics now. I don't think he went so far as to say nobody ever will. But it it is a very interesting case in the history of physics because usually, you know, we invent a new theory, whether it's Isaac Newton or electromagnetism or whatever, and it takes a little while to catch on, but then we basically understand it. Here, quantum mechanics is over 90 years old, and we don't understand certain very crucial features about the theory. The main thing is just that in quantum mechanics, unlike every other theory ever in physics, there's this idea that you need to specify what happens when you make an observation, when you look at something. In all the other theories of physics we ever had, that was just taken for granted. You just look at things and you see what they are. In quantum mechanics, apparently, when you look at things, you don't see exactly what they are. They sort of look different to you than they are when you're not looking. And that's something we've been struggling to wrap our heads around for many decades now. And what kind of progress have you made? Well, there are those among us who think we're on the right track. But the problem is there are different tracks that people are on. So uh, my favorite personal point of view, which I'm sure we'll get to, is the craziest sounding idea, I have to admit. So here's the idea. When, When you're not looking at a quantum mechanical system like an electron, there's no such thing as where it is. It's a cloud. It's, a, it's what we call a wave function. It's spread out through space. But when you look at it, when you observe this little particle, this little electron going around in an atom, you always see it located somewhere. And so that's the puzzle of quantum mechanics. Why is what you see different than what there is? And my favorite interpretation is what's called the many worlds interpretation. And it says that when you look at that quantum system, every possible measurement outcome comes true, but each in a different copy of reality. So there's a copy where I see it in one position. There's another copy where I see it in another position. And this is just happening all around us all the time. Sounds completely bizarre and like physicists have lost their minds. But in fact, it is just the straightforward prediction of the equations that we use. And the question is, do we have the courage to face up to the prediction that the equations are making? Well, you know, most of us growing up uh, heard about, uh, some of us learned about, not me, I don't think, but others, about Einstein's theory of relativity. Uh, Quantum mechanics, am I right, reaches uh, a different conclusion about the universe, universes. Yeah, you know, Einstein himself played a very important role in the early days of quantum mechanics. He Mm -hmm. was crucial in founding it. But his attitude was always that it's a step to something, but it's not the final answer. It's incomplete in some way. And you're right that his work in relativity was in a very different vein. Even though relativity is a huge deal, you know, he is Einstein for a reason, right? Uh, It was still very much in the tradition of ordinary physics, of classical physics, as we call it, the tradition that started with Galileo and Newton and people like that. We change what we thought the world was made of, but still we imagine the world is made of stuff and we can tell you how that stuff evolves over time and we can measure it and it's all precise and deterministic and clockwork. That's the classical view. And then the quantum view is that, like I said, there's a different way that things are when you're not looking at them than when you're looking at them. And so people have different theories. Like I said, one theory is that there's multiple worlds that come into existence. Another theory is that there are hidden variables that we don't know about that pick out what the result is that we're going to get. Other things are that we're not looking at reality at all. We should stop talking about reality. And so this is the uh, argument. This is the controversy that physicists have. And Einstein was completely right to say that he was skeptical that we were done yet. Boy, James. So uh, just on a little offbeat subject, have you given any thought to how far you think Villanova might go in the a, in a tournament this year? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure that it's this, their year this year, you know. Uh, I'm a Villanova <laughs> alumnus. So I, I guess James read that. And I, I, my first Wikipedia, year. man, makes me smart. <laughs> oh, wow. Exactly. I, you know, grew up, I grew up right next door. But of course, Dr. Carroll, you know, if they lose, they might win at the same time. Well, in a different world, different things can happen. But I want to be in the world where the good things happen. I, I'm much more invested in the Sixers this year. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a professional NBA fan, not a, more than a college fan. Oh, yeah, having a good oh, year. Ben Simmons. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'll start yeah. with a with a story. When I was early sixties, I was in undergrad school at LSU, and they, they had a course everybody take called books and libraries. And I made a D in it. My daddy got my grades, and he says, "Boy, this ain't exactly goddamn quantum physics at MIT." <laughs> 
<laughs> so after Clinton was elected, uh, a labor economist, I, I'm sorry, I can't think of his name, but he was a really top-rate guy, top-rate labor economist at MIT, said, I called me and said, I saw in the Globe that you'd come into Boston for some panel or forum or something, and I want you to, can you drop by my class at MIT? And I said, I'll stop by your class if you bring me to a quantum physics class at MIT. And he said, you got a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I walked in there and stayed 30 seconds and said, I heard enough. Okay. <laughs> but just so you know, I grew up, you know, thinking that quantum physicists was the, the be all to end all. You're not wrong. Your daddy was on the right track. But yeah, you know, we right have better. You should buy my book. <laughs> so, because we're in fantasy land here, and, you know, Walter Isaacson, who's my dear friend, fell in your and wrote the biography of Einstein. If we had Einstein, if we could plug him into the show, and you had one question to ask him in, in, in a kind of language that we could understand, what would you want? What would you want to know from the great man? You know, Einstein's big discovery was the idea that space and time are unified into one thing we call space-time. That's the four-dimensional world in which we live, and this space-time lives and breathes, it has a dynamics of its own and it's curved and we experience all that curvature as gravity. In my personal view, space-time is not fundamental. It's something that is gonna emerge from something deeper than that. So the one question I would like to ask Einstein is, uh, would he be happy with that? What, what, are, what are his feelings about the prospect that space-time, which was his major contribution to intellectual history, uh, is something that is not the deepest level of reality, but something that emerges from something even more deep than that. So, so Dr. Carroll, you, you sit at the, the, the very top of science. I mean, I, my dad recognized that a long time ago. And we've just been through four years uh, of where people detest science. I mean, it was mocked, it was made fun of. How did you and your colleagues, what was the sort of reaction in the upper echelon scientific community? What was, you know, you're, you're, although you're a quantum physicist, you're a citizen and you're watching what's going on. It, what, what was the kind of reaction that you had at, you know, faculty lounge at, at Caltech? Well, people certainly notice it, and it's it's it goes beyond four years, you know. Um, I had my own podcast called Mindscape, and I had... Naomi Oreskes on the show, and she is a, a professor of the history of science, and she's talked about science denialism in the context of climate change and uh, cancer and smoking and things like that. And this is, a, you know, an ongoing thing that's been going on for a long time. It has become more politicized, and I think that's the real trouble. It's not just that there are certain people who want to deny what science says. That idea has been with us forever. But the idea that your political identity is tied to how you think about science, that's incredibly, incredibly dangerous. And I think that scientists have to do something to fight against that. And and in, to be fair, scientists are not always good at fighting against that. Right. Scientists and come across as sort of very arrogant and speaking uh, from the cathedral, and et cetera. And I think that we need to be more friendly, more approachable, more warm, more human, more giving people the impression that we're on their side. You know, I'm told, I wouldn't understand it, but Max Planck was a very big deal in your field. Mm -hmm. And he once said that science does not triumph because it convinces its opponents. Science triumphs because its opponents eventually die. Science advances one funeral at the time. So he had a pretty pragmatic view of their interaction between the public and science, I think. <laughs> you know, it's very true. And it's he's speaking about within science. And, you know, Plunk himself was someone who had to die before some other ideas were fully <laughs> accepted. You know, we, we are all subject to our own maxims in that way. But but it, it is true because, you know, we grow up and when we're young, everything is new and we're open minded and we, we really think about the different possibilities. And then all of us, no matter how smart, no matter how well trained, we cling to our favorite ideas. And, and it's fine to say that, you know, eventually we'll win in the long run. But as John Maynard Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. We're all so dead. we can't <laughs> wait for that. We got to get a little bit quicker. Uh, yeah, on this show, it's a little a little short in the long run, but go ahead, Albert. <laughs> uh, I want to go, you, you, this is so enlightening, uh, Sean Carroll, really. Tell us about, I think it's Schrodinger's cat in the box theory. As I read it, uh, the, the, or as I read about it, 
Uh, you put a cat in a box with a deadly device. There's a 50-50 chance that it'll, it'll go off. You open the box and the cat is dead. Cat's also alive. Is that basically right? That's that's more or less the idea. Um, you know, in my in my book, I actually changed it so that it was sleeping gas in the box. So the cat was in a superposition of awake and asleep because I see no reason to kill the cat for uh, yeah, thought experiment right. purposes. But it, it's a fascinating little anecdote in the history of science because, like Einstein, Schrodinger was one of the biggest names in quantum mechanics. Helped found the field. The Schrodinger equation is the main equation in quantum mechanics. But he never accepted the version of quantum mechanics that became to be dominant in the early part of the 20th century. So he invents this thought experiment because he wants to show you how absurd it is what you're being so asked to fun. buy. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's trying to show you how weird it is. And the point is, like I said before, when you have an electron or a little tiny subatomic particle and quantum mechanics says... There's no position of the electron. It's a superposition of all possible things, and it becomes true when you look at it. You know, none of us has seen an electron up close and personal, so maybe we're willing to go along with that. Schrodinger invents this complicated apparatus that amplifies this idea up to a cat. <laughs> and his daughter once said, I think my father just didn't like cats. So <laughs> maybe that's why he chose that particular thought experiment. But the idea is, is that the cat is neither alive nor dead until you open the box. That's what quantum mechanics naively is telling you. And Schrodinger is trying to say, surely you don't believe that. Surely you don't believe that, number one, the cat is both alive and dead. And number two, when I open the box, it becomes one or the other. So those of us who are trying to understand quantum mechanics at a deeper level are trying to resolve the puzzle of Schrodinger's cat. Yeah, let me uh, let me sw switch uh, topics a bit. I I too read your Wikipedia and uh, it said you're 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 an atheist. Is there a inherent contradiction between science and religion? It's not an inherent contradiction, but it's a de facto <laughs> contradiction. The way I like to say it is: Look, science is trying to understand what the world is, how it works, what happens. Religion is trying to do that plus a lot more, you know? I mean, religion tells us something about the world, but it also tells us something about how to live in the world, what it means to be a good person, and things like that, which science doesn't tell us about. But when science tells us what the world is, if that's incompatible with something that religion is telling us about the world, what the world is, I'm going to go with science. And so I think that as over the last... 500 years, as we've understood more and more about the fundamental nature of reality through doing scientific investigation, the need for invoking God or spirits or anything like that has gone down to the point where now we can do better. And that raises a whole bunch of other questions. Like, well, what about how we live, how we get together, make a community? Like that stuff, I think we've fallen way behind. I think it's very important that we think more deeply about those questions than ever before. Well, let me try one more and then turn it back to James. Um, I, again, if, if I get this right, if, if, if there are many worlds out there, uh, um, much of this and not all of this is replicated somewhere. Is there really another James Carville around somewhere? No, there's only one James Carville. Sorry. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, actually, the world, the world can James. rest easy. <laughs> because there are many, if, if I'm right, and this is an idea that was first put forward by a graduate student named Hugh Everett in the 1950s, and he immediately left academia after doing it. You know, he got so much crap for uh, putting forward this idea. Uh, but no, the idea is that uh, there are many copies of me. There are many copies of James Carville. There are many copies of the entire universe. This seems to be what quantum mechanics is telling us. And again, this is what the equations predict. It's perfectly straightforward. And the question is, is it up? Do we have the ability to accept this or do we want to like fiddle with the rules to get rid of those other worlds because we don't like them? You know, the universe is a big place. We've learned this since Copernicus uh, and Bruno. You know, the world is much bigger than our imaginations. So I don't think we should be afraid of the idea there's much more out there than what we see. So, the one and only I, Mr. Carville. They, I, I don't quite know what it is, but it, apparently because I read it in a Dan Brown book, so it must be true, but there's a particle collider or something that exists in Switzerland that people I've read that is a, 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 a really big deal. 
And I, <laughs> we were supposed to like build one somewhere in Texas, I think. Is it a big deal? And where 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 do we fit? Where do we fit in this poker game? Well, it's a huge deal. There is uh, the Large Hadron Collider is the highest energy particle accelerator in the world today. It's in Geneva, Switzerland, at the CERN European Laboratory. And uh, you might remember that we had a, a, a program called the Superconducting Super Collider that was right. going to be built in Texas. It was going to be done first, and it was going to be better. It was going to be higher energy. Uh, but I, ha- I got to say, you know, honesty compels me, the first... Uh, Clinton administration let Congress kill it. And so ever since then, in the early 1990s, uh, the United States has not even been trying to lead the world in advanced particle physics. It's now a competition between Europe and Asia. There's there's ideas for new colliders in Japan or China and also in Europe, and the United States isn't even trying to play the game. So Bill, let's get right down to the, to the nut cutting here. If you take, and I'm not exactly sure why, neither most anybody else listening to the show know, but we, we, instinctively, I think our ability in quantum physics has got a lot to do with our progress as a nation going forward. From what you're telling me, it's like everything else, we're, we're falling behind. Yeah, you and, know, I think, I, I want to give credit where it's due. There's a lot of different versions of research in quantum mechanics, quantum physics, theoretical physics more broadly, and experimental physics. And in some, the United States is leading the world. um, And in some others, it's not. So particle physics, the idea that you have this giant machine and you smash together particles with enormous energies, that is one area in which we're definitely falling behind. But there are other areas like quantum computing, where you're putting together little devices that make use of the rules of quantum mechanics to solve really hard calculational problems, there we're, we're leading the world. And so, you know, I think that we have to pick and choose our priorities, but I, I agree very much with the general sentiment that the United States, you know, both should and can lead the world if it wants to. And sometimes we don't quite measure up because there are projects that take years, right? And, and the U.S., both in space and in physics and in other areas, whenever there's a project that needs a 10-year commitment, we're really bad at that (laughs) because 10 years from now, who knows who's going to be in charge anymore? And we're not very good at sticking to our previously agreed upon arrangements. So we're good at things that are small and quick, but things that are big and really require commitment and planning, we've fallen behind on. So in the last 100 PhDs that Caltech has awarded, how many have been awarded to U.S. citizens? Just rough, rough. Oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a uh, a good question. Um, I'm going to guess about half, but I really don't know. Okay, I don't know. No, it's yeah. not. I, you know, I expected it. I just, I'm just kind of a general no, idea. But because there's a group of people, I'd say that you know our elite institutions are better than anybody else's, and people who are adversaries send people to our institutions, and. We teach them stuff. I mean, some guy, apparently, from what I read, it, it, I was not particularly convinced by it, but didn't some, like, high-end scientists at MIT or Harvard get arrested? I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm going to forget about it. But that, that is an issue, to, that, is a issue that, that we're, we're educating our adversaries to some extent. It is an issue, but I think the issue goes the other way. Uh, in fact, I think it very, very strongly, because what happens is, number one, the rest of the world sends their best, brightest people to the United States. And a lot of them stay here. Like, that's the big driver of progress in the United States. You know, the most recent COVID vaccine was invented by Turkish immigrants. Steve Jobs was an immigrant. You know, we welcome these people in. We give them access to our best and brightest ideas. And they realize that they have a much better deal than they did back home. And they stay here and they help make this country great. Even the people who do go back to their countries, they've been a little bit exposed to the American experience. They don't want to be part of a repressive totalitarian dictatorship anymore. They're often the leaders in uh, revolutionary or dissenting movements. So I think that every single thing we can do to bring the world's best people to the United States and have them be educated here helps our country in every conceivable way. That's a really good point. I just, I'm just close to making a point. During the, when Trump was in and they had the migration and stuff, LSU has like 123 Iranian engineering students. 
And of course, they had to arrange, you know, of course, these universities love them because they pay full freight. <laughs> All right. Yes. And they had to go and open dorms and cafeterias and stuff. Now, no one would have ever thought that LSU would have 100 and so We have 123 Iranian engineering students. Can you imagine what the University of Illinois has or, or you know, UCLA or something like that? It, 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 it just opened my eyes. It was like, a, are you kidding me? Yeah. You know, well, we're like training said, a lot of people. We, we are training these people, and Iran is an especially – very interesting case, I think, because, you know, a some certain number of years ago when I was a kid in the 70s, you know, Iran was one of the more liberal countries uh, in terms of free speech and things like that and westernization in uh, what we call the Middle East. And uh, obviously they had a revolution and things changed dramatically there. But that spirit kind of lingers on in some real sense. Iran is a natural ally, I think, of the United States. If it weren't led by uh, theocrats who, you know, hated Israel and the United States, the, the people of Iran, I think, you know, should be on our side a little bit more. It's very technologically advanced. It's it's very culturally rich. And I think that we're just making things worse by holding them at bay as much as we can, rather than trying to become more part of a single community. I could not agree with you more. I, I think this is such a terrible that Iran publishes three times more books than every Arab speaking nation in the, in the world. And I just think we're, you know, yeah, I don't like the regime, but we're making a exactly. bad bet against that country. A really, really bad bet. I, I agree with you so much. Uh, Dr. Carolyn, so what how some guy from like me signs common ground with you, but boy, we have it on that question. Woo, Albert. <laughs> No, we do. Boy, this has really, really been enlightening. So one final really, really tough question. Are your 76ers finally going to win it this year? Yep. Boy. <laughs> Total you know, I just, I is, just Is Embiid had hurt or was he hurt? Or what, what's his status right now? He is hurt. I was watching the game, uh, but it's just a deep knee bruise. He'll be back in a couple of weeks. And uh, hopefully that'll give him a little time to rest up. And you know, I just had Daryl Morey on my podcast. Daryl Morey is the general right. manager of and uh, right now, everything seems to be going well. That They're playing well. They're fired up. Doc Rivers is their coach. There's He's a great, a great coach. He's a great coach. No one else is really dominating the NBA this year. Why not the Sixers this year? I'm all in favor of it. It's, it's mm. not like my day when Dr. J and Moses Malone were there, but it, it's the next best thing. It's well, not well, fo we, fo we, fo <laughs> we beat the Clippers and we beat the Jazz, but we couldn't beat the Timberwolves. So I, I'm throwing shit at the TV right now. We'll get over it. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I, I grew up outside of Philadelphia, so I, I, I still sort of cheer for the 76ers and I really cheer for Villanova. So I'm best of luck with both. And thank you so much. This really, really was enlightening. I mean it. You, you exceeded expectations. My pleasure. It's great to be on. I, I especially like talking to audiences that I don't usually talk to. So this was a wonderful opportunity. That's terrific. I, uh, I think our audience appreciates it very much yeah. i really do i know i did it was it's like it's it's nice to know that people can be that talented and that human you know sometimes we just think that you know people that really can do things that we can't do they live on another planet and what what i learned today is we're all you're on the same planet with us <laughs> and that, that's refreshing that's refreshing <laughs> it is tell me something did you grow up um near villanova I grew up in Bucks County, which is just north of oh, Philadelphia. Yeah. So no, I, no, lower well. Bucks. Yep, lower Bucks, Yardley. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Know it, know it well. <laughs> yeah. I can take the train in. Well, it's a swing district, right? Yeah. You know, every every few years we have a congressperson from a different uh, party. So I, I'm sure that most politicians know my my hometown pretty well, actually. Yeah, they do. But it's become certainly more, slightly more reliably Democratic in presidential races. But. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, Pete Kostmeyer was the congressman I grew up with. I don't know if you remember oh, yeah. that name. Sure, I remember. Yeah. I, remember. I, know. Well, yeah. I was Bob yeah. Case's campaign manager in 1986. <laughs> of course. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, Philadelphia politics, man, it's kind of a mess. I got. <laughs> oh. oh. Yeah, but you know <laughs> something, Sean, that's really fascinating is that those four Philadelphia suburbs now have more votes than, than, than Pittsburgh and Philadelphia combined. 
Uh, mm, that's... Yeah, I believe certainly rapid growth is something that I, you know, I moved away a while ago, but I would go back for every Christmas and it's like there's more traffic and more oh, parking lots every time I go back. And yeah. they provided the margin for Joe Biden. He won, I think, by 100,000 more votes than Hillary won in 16 in those four suburbs. And that's how he carried Pennsylvania. You know, Philadelphia and the whole area was so proud of themselves for uh, bringing uh, Joe Biden over the finish line there with gritty oh. and the whole bit. Yeah, we were, in, we were enjoying it the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank goodness she did. I'll never forget, I'll never forget uh, anyway, election night. It looked good. I said, all you Democrats, put the razor blades and the ambient back in the medicine cabinet. Put it back in, yeah. <laughs> wow. The, the, the anti-suicide people said I was making light of suicide. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't make light of suicide. I've had it in my family. But anyway, was, thank you so much, Dr. Carroll. Thank, thank you, you very much again. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me on. It's been great fun. Okay, great. All right, James, now for the segment that we love. We love all of our segments, but we you know, especially love this segment. It's the questions from our listeners, and they are good, and they're from all over the globe. Let's start with Chris in Liverpool, UK. He says, looking ahead to the 22 midterms, is there something to be said for the notion that this could be, this could be one of those unusual years where the president's party actually makes gains? It happened in 1998. It happened in 2002. What are the odds this time? I, I, that is, if, if, if there was like one question that I spend more time talking about on the phone than that, I can't think of what it is because obviously we're not thinking about theoretical physics. And, and the question is, first of all, as I understand it, redistricting is going to cost us some house seats up front if you, if you just basically had a jump ball. It in no. the... the Sean, but the, the, the new head of the DCCC, he's very good. He's from New York. Uh, God damn, I'm having a brain fart here, but that's all right. I get old. He's Sean, very is good. Maloney? Yeah, Sean Maloney. And the most yeah. undervalued part in terms of the House, and I think this is too in terms of the Senate, is recruiting. And we got out-recruited in 2020. Now, we probably wouldn't have, you know, state legislative race didn't go well, so, so we, we didn't have a, you and I both agree, November 3rd wasn't, other than Biden, there wasn't much to be happy about. I mean, Georgia significantly saved us. But I hope that they're out there recruiting hard uh, in challenging some some of these districts. And, you know, the Senate map, and I I think our our, our, uh, listener is is right, the Senate map, in a if everything was even, favors us slightly, maybe a little bit more than slightly. And if Goldman Sachs is right now, it's not very fashionable to invoke Goldman Sachs. But if we have 8% growth, it's going to be really, really hard. And Biden is doing something very smart. He's just not engaging in the culture wars. Mm -hmm. And people, I mean, what the belief that people get here is going to be real. I mean, it's going to make a difference in people's lives. And the it, proof of it is none of them voted for it, but they're all trying to figure out a way to, to say that they like it. So they, they're, they're going back home and they're right. hearing something. Right. Uh-huh. No, I, I agree. I, I, think, I, I, think I think his point is, is – no, go ahead. I, I, I was going to say – I think his I point is – it's the most interesting point. That's the most relevant question that this show uh, – you know, and we will spend more time between now and Election Day 2022 – on this topic than, than any other, because that's why we have a podcast. Right. Well, I, I think that the Senate does actually tilt towards uh, Democrats picking up uh, at least a seat or two. There have been six Republican retirements already. Now, some of them are just old, but it tells you something. And there are a couple of seats. There are several seats that are actually very competitive, if not better, Pennsylvania, North Carolina. Uh, you know, conceivably, uh, Ohio and Missouri were the right candidate. And I think Grassley's going to have to retire and maybe even Iowa. So I think I would I would be pretty optimistic if I were Schumer. House is harder because you're going to lose, as you say, a half dozen seats maybe to redistricting. But again, if it's a good year and it's a, and you get good candidates, there are some Republicans who won last time who uh, could be beaten this time. So we'll see. Yeah, let's not forget Wisconsin and Florida. Right. <laughs> Right. No, no, I, I would be less in, in confident about, about Florida, but I sure would be about Wisconsin. You're right. That's I, I, I am 
I am higher on Florida than Democratic consensus. We've been there before, James. Well, I, I understand. And anyway. I think that some, I think we run shitty campaigns. I don't well, think anything is that wrong with Florida. I think what's wrong is the campaigns that we run. Well, you know, and remember, we lost a Senate seat by 10,000 votes in 2018. Yeah, against a reasonably popular Senate. Anyway, well, I, well, let's hope. I, but I would keep Reasonably my eye on Wisconsin. A, a well Jill, in Fresno, Cal- Jill in Fresno, California, says people keep saying we need 50 Stacey Abrams. But if that's the case, what's the TNC doing, or more precisely what they're not doing? Is Harrison any better than the uh, the Obama era in the last four years, the DNC. I, I, look, I, I, I mean, the guy's been in there, what, for a month. I, I think he'll probably be pretty good. Uh, Stacey Abrams running for the governorship in Georgia, I think, depends on one thing and one thing only, and that is passing the so-called election reform H.R. 1. If they enact those laws, those restrictive voting laws in Georgia, which the, the legislature is already passing, it is really hard for her to win. If those can, if it can be some kind of national standards, I think she's got a hell of a shot to win in 2022. Well, I, I, this is something that I, I, I actually was first bringing this out, and it's coming to fruition. They're starting to put heat on these corporations in Georgia. And, and, and when this show is over, I'm going to do a Zoom call with some reporters bringing this heat. And I think people are starting to understand that this is a, 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 a valuable era, area for Democrats, or for just people voting right, but any everybody's for voting again. I go, the, the the felons' right to vote in Florida got what percent out? Sixty-four. Like 64. Right. Yeah. right. I, so it's not. It's not. This is the easiest thing we've ever done. Right. This it's is basic. so easy. The arguments are so basic and so easy. It's not funny. So Unless you're the, I haven't. Uh, the top official in our top public official in Arizona who basically said uninformed people really aren't, uh, we really don't need for them to vote. Well, yeah, right. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's not what Look, we were he's just like he, the, the problem with these people, they can't stop confessing. Right. He says that if Trump said that Trump said, if everybody voted, we wouldn't win. Right. And he got Ron Johnson saying, well, I wasn't scared because these are white people. If they would have been black people, I'd have been scared. Now he, originally he said they were Antifa. So he, how, how could, well, of course he would have been scared. Of, I don't even know what the fuck Antifa is. Neither does he. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but his logic is so Ron Johnson. He's so, he's so stupid that you can't believe it. But when I was in politics and roughly national politics from 1982 to, I don't know, 2012, the, the, the RNC just meant so much more. It was a bigger, the DNC is, but Ron Brown, we, we were lucky in 92. Maybe we had something to do with our luck, but, but Ron was a, was a great DNC chair and actually did something. For the most part, if you go to a DNC meeting, I don't, I don't find it in, in the past. And I'm, I hope Jamie, you know, really makes the place sort of hardcore political, you know, really focuses on, its role in how, how you win elections and raise money. I don't, you know, I, I'm critical of Perez in the past. I don't know if he's any worse than some of the others we had. Maybe at, at the end of the day, acquitted himself pretty good. But in Democratic culture, the DNC has traditionally not held the kind of iconic status that the RNC yeah. holds. We're, we're much bigger into the committees. But maybe this is changing. I hope Jamie can can change it. And I, I think he's got the skill and the knowledge and the, he's got the support of if the president wants to make it work better, it can work better. We have one from Lynn in central Maine. Lynn, tell us next time where you're from in central Maine. Cause I love that state. Uh, and there's such great little towns there. Uh, and she said that this is the sad anniversary of one year of COVID. And she's been watching these incredibly touching tributes to people who've died and some reunited with their family. She wants to know, James, has Fox doing anything similar? Shit. It's a, <laughs> what COVID? What COVID? Right? So, uh, in that, uh, and I, I love me. Uh, Janet Mills, the governor up there, like, she's one of our very people in politics. I mean, she's so, she's so real and salty. It, 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 it's unbelievable. And Angus King. You know, Ang- Angus King. I mean, Maine has had, you talk about a state that punches above its weight. Oh, and political well, talent. I, that might be 
you, you know, in terms of Titans and James G. Blaine and Joshua Lawrence Joshua Chamberlain, Chamberlain and right. yeah, right. Martin, you know, Muskie, Mitchell, Chase right. Smith, and uh, right. said the favorite of all time, George Mitchell. I mean, I you just could say, you know, Angus King, uh, just the names roll off. I mean, I, for some reason, that state has produced an inordinate amount of political talent. For sure. So is Fox is Fox not covering COVID, James? Is that what you're telling us? <laughs> so, you know, I'm thinking a year ago. It's almost like a year. I, I I think we all kind of collectively had our oh shit moment, like March the 12th or 14th or something like that. And we were doing the show then. And if you would have said a year from now, we would have a a highly effective vaccine. That was being distributed at a at a really good clip, and we had declining case numbers. <clears throat> we did have worrisome variants. You know, it's hard to say this to somebody who lost someone this disease or long haulers, and but I, I I expected worse. I really did. I would I would I would have I would have taken that. You know, if if you said this is what I'll give you, you you take the crap shoot. I would have taken that. Yeah, I, yeah. I I thought May June and you know until I thought we were just in, in some doomed loop here. I'm not a scientist, but I, I'm much more optimistic about this today than I was a year ago. James, this is one that you will like. Dot in Austin, Texas. She says she's curious because given that she shares your New Orleans roots, her family's been in New Orleans for nearly 200 years. She's born in Mobile, raised in Virginia, but educated in Washington, now resides in Austin. But her grandmother is a neighbor of yours on Palmer Avenue. So she wants you to speak to the phenomenon of Southern blue dog Democrats and the shift among Southern Democrats towards Bush and ultimately Trump. Can you bring any of them back? You know, it's funny because it obviously all of that is true. And with your mother on, on, on my street, I just I think we sold our house. So one of the great houses I've ever seen in my life. It was just a, a staggering pleasure to live there for over twelve years. It, it is Palm Avenue, in, in my view, is one of the great streets in America. Uh, and it's just an interesting side story about Ty. Is Palm Avenue was named after a, I think it was a Presbyterian pro-Confederate minister. And it, it got on the list to change the street name. This is something for people to think about, just the intersection of how things work. And I'm not going to live on it anymore. And so the, the commission that they had to change the names wanted to call it Edith Stern Avenue. The, the, Edith Stern was a great woman by anybody's stretch. It was Channel 6, I think, they owned in New Orleans. Very, very progressive very racially advanced. It's, there ought to be five things named after either Stern in New Orleans. But the, the, the Stern family, like, we don't want to do this. And so the people on Palmer, there, there, there was a significantly talented drummer by the name of Buddy Palmer, who was an African-American. And they're saying, we will put a plaque at the foot of Palmer Avenue and St. Charles Avenue saying this street is named for Buddy Palmer. And, and, you know, right next to Palmer Avenue is Calhoun Street. Well, there's no way you can save Calhoun Street. We'll just say that that's a done. That's a done deal. That's Robert E. Lee. But I'm not sure it's not a reasonable compromise to say it's no longer named after Reverend. And I don't have a stake in it because I don't live there. I'm not going to live there anymore. But I mean, some of these things that happen, it's just a, I think it's an interesting look at how these controversies meet real life. And that one compromise, I don't have a stake in it, seemed to be, well, not unreasonable. We could rename the Stonewall Jackson memorials for Jesse Jackson? You know, that's a little different. Okay, no one knows who the Presbyterian Reverend Palmer was. All right? But, but, but we all know who Stonewall Jackson was, or Justin Davis, or, you know, John C. Right. Calhoun. I'm just putting in a, a, a plug that, you know, if you lose the nuance in history, you, you, why study history? 
if, if history is just absolutism, it, 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 it makes the topic, you know, we, we went through that with time. We're so proud of that show. Yeah. And you pick your fights. And when you pick them, you win them. And, and if he'd have done a, a, a book about, you know, some Presbyterian seminary student would have done a book, you know, Reverend Palmer and me, no one would have given a shit. Right. You know, it, it's well, just people that you, you got to pick your symbols and you got to pick your fights. That, that's what I try to teach my students, you know? Yeah. We got one to Doc to close this up. We got one for Doc in the in the Florida Panhandle. Doc, I love the name Doc. Uh, so you don't even have to tell us you're Doc who. He asked James, "What the hell happened to Bill Barr? He's disappeared from the face of the earth. Is he going to be investigated for some of the pranks he pulled during the Trump years?" Yeah, I, I'm gonna throw that back to you because you, you're you're my conduit and interpreter of high end Washington. And in, for, for reasons, the, the sort of people thought about, boy, yes, he's, he's more conservative than you think. He's, he's you know kind of right-wing guy, but he's not a, a he, he follows the law and, and he'll, he'll do things that you won't like, but he'll be constrained by the parameters of the institution. But you know what? He wasn't. And, and, and to the credit of the people that said that, they would say, God, I can't believe it. I mean, no one is saying, justifying to say, I just totally misread the guy. And his speech at Notre Dame was one of the more disgusting things I've ever turned about curbs on human rapacity. Oh, God, please. All right? The, 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 the Catholic, the the, the, the I, I don't, don't let's don't get started on that. Well, I listen. He but is, Barr turned out to not just, he he didn't turn out to be a, a conservative legal scholar. He turned out to to promote criminality. Until the end, he was an enabler, no question. And I think he's got a terribly okay, tarnished. Okay, let me, I correct that. Not promote, enable criminality. Yeah, he I, he, he, very ought good to, he ought to have it. a tarnished repula tarnished reputation. And if he's hiding, he ought to be hiding. I don't think he faces any legal investigations, but I do think there's going to be stuff that's going to come out about some of the things they did, whether it's going easy on Manafort and Stone or some of the other decisions that he made. I think I think there will be a transparency that will reveal that, and that tarnished reputation will be all the more tarnished. Yeah, History will, will be justifiably unkind to William Barr. As it should be. Absolutely. And, and it shouldn't be unkind to people who told us that, interpreters that told us he was, a, you know, an institutionalist or whatever that. Right. He looked that, better that than Jeff Sessions. In the middle of the Potomac at the bottom of the river. Right. Okay, James, uh, the outrage of the week segment. Six Asian Americans were murdered at Atlanta spas this week. Now, this may not have been racially motivated. The guy may have been sick in another way. But it does remind us that there's been a surge in threats and violence against Asian Americans over the past year, over 3,000 incidents. It's not a new phenomenon, but the increase, I think, is largely attributable to Donald Trump's demagoguery, the spin about the Chinese, the China flu, and all that. James, as you know, this is, for me, personal. We have an adopted daughter who's Asian-American. We're so proud of her and our grandson. And the fact that she has to face the threat of more hate is just absolutely outrageous. Uh, this is just one more example of the enduring damage this evil man did. And I just hope a lot of Republicans, as well as Democrats in the media, will highlight and try to counter this violent surge, because it really is just dreadful. It is. And, I, you know, people... One of the things when you become well known and you know you're kind of Al and Judy and et cetera et cetera and you know people forget you you have an adopted Asian daughter and, and you have a a a, a, a son with, with disabilities right. and so these and, and when people become successful they're not immune from the, the, what happens to everybody else in life but it gives you a a perch on which to to feel how this is. And, and, and 
you know, during the whole Black Lives Matter movement and the police, and but still goes like not that it's going away. You can't imagine how much time I spent thinking if I would have adopted a black male son, how it would have felt when they went out with his buddies in the French Quarter. Oh. I mean, if you don't think that shit's real, just think about that. Vernon Jordan worried about his grandson going out at night. Oh, I, I, yeah. I would be worried. And conversely, if my daughter was a New Orleans policeman, I would be worried that she'd be, you know, I, it, it, it is possible. It is possible. If, if this country could ever understand this, it is possible to hold two contradictory thoughts at the same time. Yep, it is. Right? It, What's it your really outrage, is. James? I, you know, I, I, I'm going to stick with yours because I like the way that this discussion went. And, you know, it, 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 you know, when people see you, you know, they say, hey, babe, that's the ultimate white guy. There's nobody white. And oh, you got a daughter yeah. who's, you know, adopted Korea. You got a grandson. All right. They have a dog. You have, you have, you have to deal with, 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 you know, disability issues every day. And, and I just hope this show develops a, a, a sensitivity with our listeners that we sort of understand this and, and try to different vantage points to bring something else to the show. And I, I just think it's a, it, that you're speaking about this and Lauren is, is, is in, of course, this guy, from what I know, it, 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 when these people, it, there's this incel culture and he claimed he was a sex addict. I, I have no idea for all I know when I was his age, but, but, the idea that you just you, you, you shooting people. I mean, it's, you, 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 what is it? You know, and of course he's a quintessential, you know, screwed up guy, and they don't know if he had a a, a motive to this. But man, it's it it, it, it it's, it's really bad. You know, I it mean, is. you you, you got to be able to take no and go home. <laughs> right, right. No, it's a uh, it's a I, sick guy. I, 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 I don't touch buddy yours. Yeah, I don't know that the Atlanta incident had anything to do with race, but I do know that an awful lot of Asian Americans are being threatened. There's and you know who's lot. to blame? Donald John Trump is You're 80% right. of the blame of this. I, I totally you, agree. you start blaming people, right? and people get the signal, well, it's okay to beat the shit out of black people. Well, you know, okay. Right. It's okay to beat the shit out of, you know, Hispanic people. It's okay to beat the shit out of Asian people. And it's just, it, it's so, it's such a, a troubling point about modern America and the whole, and there's no, and, and people keep saying, well, you know, James, there's, there's every reason that the Asians should be Republicans. They believe in hard work. They, they believe in, Democrats don't believe in hard work. And we just concede that point. The, the reason that they're Democrats is because they see that vulnerable people have been by much more protected by the ideals of the Democratic Party than I'm going to say that the modern conservatism ha has ideals, but they used to. And, and, and of, of course, people wonder what. Well, look at the Jews. They, 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 you know, they earn like Episcopalians and and, and they vote like Puerto Ricans. Look, the reason they do is, is they've had some experience with discrimination. And, and it, 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 I don't know, let me inform, in, in case you were, somebody was on this show that doesn't understand it, there are higher values within the democratic philosophy than low taxes. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand what it means. Yeah. No. And that's why they flummox about why, you know, Jews and Asians and, you know, people like that vote overwhelmingly Democratic. And by the way, I, can, I got news for you, Republicans. These younger Asians that come in this country, they're not going to like you. They don't like it. Well, and, you and know, if there's if they're, if they're, I think you identify with, James. If you tell people you don't like them, they tend not to vote for you. Uh, yeah, they, and they, they hear it. Yeah, they, they do. Hear. They yeah. do. Well, let's hope. Uh, Let's hope that people and rise that goes, up. And that's true of, 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 of Muslim people or whoever comes in here. Right. 
It is. And, and the Democrats have paid a price, but it, it's not a secret is why they vote, they, they overwhelmingly vote for Democrats and not Republicans, and it doesn't have to do with the top marginal tax rate. Yeah, totally. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon, when we'll be joined by senior editor at The Atlantic, Ron Brownstein, with a great new book. Please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our War Room planning.